I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. I have always loved the classic Italian tonato sauce made with tinned tuna, but this version made with smoked mackerel is a discovery I'm really pleased with. Fine ripened heritage tomatoes and sweet basil are perfect with smoked fish, and the egg adds a richness to complete a very satisfying dish. The overused phrase, the total is greater than the sum of its parts, could have been invented for this dish. So the tonato is really, really simple. You just need some lovely quality mayonnaise. So I have a little I made earlier. And I put that into a food processor. And we're going to whiz this up with some of the smoked mackerel. So some of the smoked mackerel goes in to the actual tonato itself. And then some of it will be used to actually decorate each place. And I love the idea of being able to use um, smoked mackerel, in this case, instead of tuna, which is the more sort of obvious um, solution here. It goes in. So this is lovely, traditionally smoked mackerel, smoked in an old smokehouse. In this case, I'm going to just take off the skin because the skin would be sort of stringy. Some people like to eat that, but in this case, it would not be good. It usually pulls off really easily like that. And just break that in. It doesn't have to be too small because the machine is going to do all of that work in a couple of moments. If your mayonnaise is particularly thick, it might take a few drops of water, but honestly, hardly ever. So that goes in. So a few little drops of lemon juice. Don't make the lemon the overpowering flavour, but you can imagine the way the lemon is going to cut through the richness of the fish. Don't overprocess it, because mackerel, like any oily fish, for example, such as salmon or mullet, has got a lot of oil in it. And if you overprocess it, it can be heated by the friction of the machine and that might cause this to curdle. And I also like it when it's slightly, like a sort of slightly stringy, like a rillette, if you like. That should be, yeah, that's just perfect like that. Not over pureed, and that's absolutely, that's absolutely the way I like it. Okay, the next thing I need to look at are the tomatoes. So I've got some little tomatoes here, which I've just sliced. A little pinch of the usuals that you'd expect here, a little salt a little pepper, and also a tiny pinch of sugar. Just a little pinch of sugar, just to lift the flavor. And then in this case, very, very simply dressed with a little bit of olive oil, because we've got lots of flavor from the mackerel, and we've got some other strong flavors to come. And I also have some basil leaves there sitting, ready also to go on the plate. So this makes a very sort of aromatic and quite sweet smelling combination of ingredients. You're pretty much ready to assemble now. I'm just going to do an individual plate. So about a tablespoon of the mixture per person. So not too much, because it's, you know, as you can imagine, that's quite rich. And I'll spread it out like that. It's still flecked with little bits of mackerel. Then on top of that, we pop on our other strong ingredients, which are going to add the flavor here. I have a little bit of anchovy. And anchovy and smoked fish is really, really fantastic. So just like that. And then another quite strong ingredient, a few capers. So I usually put six or seven on each portion. And you can imagine the way the little sort of vinegary, salty punch that you get from the capers is really, really uh, delicious. Then um, a little hard boiled egg. These have been boiled for exactly 10 minutes in boiling salted water. Not before you put on your tomatoes, by the way. like that, then that little egg on there like that. A few more little bits of smoked mackerel, even though we have it in the um, tonato, I like to just show, show that off a little bit more. And then a little basil. And the basil, of course, with the tomatoes is perfect. It's also really good with the eggs and it's really good with the uh, mackerel. So all of these flavors work beautifully together. And then if there's a little, little juice like that left on your tomato plate, just drizzle a little over like that. And that is that. So again, 
It's one of those things you could almost call it fast food. Um, a little bit of bread and butter or some new potatoes. Simple, fast food, but delicious. Spring lamb is a treat, and as such, it is expensive. If it is spring lamb that you want, with its mild and sweet flavour, make sure to stress the word spring to your butcher and give him plenty of notice and you will be rewarded for your forward thinking. I also want to show you how to cook lamb's liver, kidney and sweetbreads, which if carefully cooked can be just as rewarding as the scene-stealing roast leg of lamb. Getting a leg of lamb into the oven to roast is just the simplest thing. Um, the one thing I do like to see on the leg of lamb is a little bit of extra fat, which will render out during the cooking, add flavour to the meat and also add succulents. The only thing I do is sometimes I put a few tiny little cuts like that. Now I'm not going too deep in. I don't really, if possible, want to go in as far as the flesh, okay? But I'm just going to allow the excess fat to run off. And what happens is it bubbles to the surface and it runs down over the surface of the meat and it becomes a self-basting piece of meat. It's so sweet and lovely, all it takes to make it taste delicious is a little bit of salt and some pepper. Preheat your oven. I have my oven preheated to 180 and a leg of lamb about this size I will take about an hour and 20 minutes. Okay, good. Great. While the lamb is cooking, I'm going to go ahead and make the mint hollandaise sauce to serve with the lamb. So, very simply, I've got some eggs. So the best eggs you can get your hands on for this. And um, we just use the egg yolk, so you can keep your, save your eggs whites for another day. So, separate them. Like that. Um, then add in a little, just a very little water, but dessert spoon to a tablespoon of water like that. Now the key to making hollandaise sauce is a low heat. So I've got my heat on very low here and I'm using a nice heavy saucepan. The other thing to say is my butter is diced and ready here, but it's cold. I find you get a sauce um, made with cold butter that is sort of cleaner in flavor and not as rich tasting. Right, three or four lumps of butter in together like that and then whisk. Having your little bit of water, a little bit of extra water here as a safety valve is no harm either. Because if you see it starting to scramble, pull it off the heat, the saucepan that is, add in a tiny bit more water, whisk for Ireland, and it'll be perfect again in a couple of minutes. So a few more little lumps of butter, three or four. Like that, and keep whisking. Now you note the way the sauce is thickening up, that sort of light sort of coating sort of consistency. It's the way it's just lightly coating the coil of the whisk. Then, very importantly, just a few little drops of lemon juice. The lemon juice just cuts through the richness and sharpens up the flavor. It's very important. But careful, don't make it into a lemon sauce. But the last little bits of butter just disappearing in there. That's perfect. Take it off the heat and turn off the heat. That's the sauce ready. You could just put the mint in now and take it straight to the table and that would be delicious. But I'm just, as I said, just I have it ready in advance and I can uh, keep this warm until my leg of lamb is cooked. And what I like to do is just pop it into a little bowl which is sitting in a saucepan which has got warm water in it. So, let's give it a little stir up there. Pop that in there. Okay, you don't have a large quantity, you don't need a large quantity. It's rich, so a little of drizzle of this. So I'll come back to that later on, put in the chopped mint when our lamb is ready to serve. The lamb has been cooking for an hour and 20 minutes. I like it to be a little bit pink in the center. You might allow it an hour and a half if you want it 
so less pink. And very importantly at this stage, I've just turned down the oven temperature to about 60, 70 degrees to allow the lamb to rest and relax before we carve it. So that's all happening there. It looks so beautiful and burnished at this stage. I mean, it's so easy. Then, also in here, because we need vegetables, crucially important, so I've just roasted some carrots and scallions, a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper, until they're just starting to get tender. They'll be brilliant with the roast lamb. So we're, we're nearly ready to go, except I want to talk to you about some of the other bits of the lamb that I absolutely adore, and I think are sometimes perhaps undervalued, and if not undervalued, definitely underused. I've got three bits of what's called offal here, coming from the inside of the lamb. I've got lamb's liver, in which we all know lamb's liver is full of all sorts of good things. And with lamb, I usually cut the liver about one centimetre thick, like that. Because I find that way, I can cook it just so it's slightly pink in the middle, but some people like it well done. The next thing, I think which is pretty recognisable, is a lamb's kidney. It's surrounded in this sort of rather amazing sort of coating of quite thick fat. So what I do quite simply is I'm going to cut straight down through the fat like that. And then you cut the liver or the kidney pretty much in half. Then peel off the fat and you will notice, apart from the fat, there's also a little bit of membrane there. So if you just peel, you get at the edge of the kidney like that you bring the membrane with the fat, and that makes the job so much easier. And then it's attached, so you need to just cut through there where it's still attached. So again, just pop it out like that, cut it off the fat. Then I like to just remove the little tough bits of membrane and remaining fat from the center there. So I just get my knife in behind it there, you don't have to get every last bit because those little bits, some of them will render out in the pan when we're cooking this. The final ingredient that I love here are the sweetbreads. And these are either the thymus or the pancreatic gland from the animal. Now these need to be given a wash. So I've literally just put them into a bowl of cold water under a, a, under a sort of a dripping tap and that just washes any excess blood out of them and they come sort of clean looking like that. So then, to cook the sweetbreads, you start off by just putting them into a saucepan and poaching them. You can either use water or I use, usually use chicken stock. To give me a nicer size, I just cut them in half horizontally, like that. Great, now we're ready to cook these lovely ingredients. So I'm going to melt a little bit of butter in a pan and I'm going to put the kidneys in first because they take longest to cook. So pop them in like that, and then I'm going to put the liver in beside it, pretty much in a single layer. Just to season. Keep an eye on your temperature of your pan, and these will start to seal up nice and quickly. So, see the way the liver just gets a little color on it very quickly like that. Let's turn the kidneys. So yeah, the kidneys take probably three or four times longer to cook than the liver. So I'm going to take those out for a moment. They'll all be going back in again in shortly. The, liver, the kidneys I'm going to leave in the pan for the duration of making the sauce and our very delicate sweetbreads they just go in at the very last minute just to warm through because we've already cooked those. Now, a little bit of garlic into the pan. Just cook that for a moment. In there. Um, a little bit of whiskey to flame and add flavor. So careful when you're doing this. Just lift the pan off the flame and then pour in a little like that. Allow it to bubble, pop it back on. It doesn't have to flame, so there don't have to be fireworks. So no fireworks today. Then I've got lovely thick stock. Now it's quite important. See the way the syrup, or I beg your pardon, the whiskey looks slightly syrupy now. That means we've boiled off the raw flavor 
where we've got the sort of the deeper, rounder flavour. A little bit of this lovely, rich stock. Because we're not going to have an awful lot of sauce here, but we want plenty of lovely flavour. So let that swirl in. Now, it's safe now for me to add back in my liver, like that, and any of the lovely juices that came out of them while they were sitting. I'm also now going to add in my sweetbreads, because I want those to warm through in the sauce. Sprinkle in your tarragon now, and make sure that just gets mixed in through all the ingredients. A little splash of cream, and I just want that to thicken up ever so slightly. Okay, that's, that's just bubbling away there very gently. I don't want that sauce to get too thick. Now, we're adding in our mint into the hollandaise sauce, which is like what I like to do at the last minute. Now, it's important to say at this stage, even though I'm putting all these together today in this one meal, because I want to illustrate to you the beauty of the lamb offal, I would not serve particularly Certainly if I was serving the offal with the roast leg of lamb, I wouldn't serve the, the hollandaise with in that case, because that would be just too much of a good thing. A little sprig or two of tarragon just to uh, garnish up the lovely plate of offal and then um, a few sprigs of rosemary just to add not unnecessary drama to the leg of lamb but also in the form of celebrating this sort of fabulous produce um, that we're lucky enough to have growing in this country and then the mint hollandaise sauce particularly for the leg of lamb a few potatoes a feast The combination of cream, vanilla, chocolate, caramel and hazelnuts is very good indeed. And it's worth infusing the cream with the hazelnuts so that the panna cotta tastes very special. The key to a good panna cotta is that it's just barely set and wobbles as you bring it to the table. If the cream is too set, the delicate and trembling nature of the dish is lost. So I've roasted some hazelnuts to remove most of the skins. There's a rogue hazelnut there. And uh, if you don't get every last bit of the skin off the roasted hazelnuts, that doesn't matter. The reason you roast them is to elevate the flavor. That's really, in this case, the reason why we roasted them. They only need to be coarsely chopped because what we're trying to do is to break into the nut so that it will release its flavor into the cream. So we'll warm the cream very lightly. Okay, so they're going to go into my cream. And we're going to bring this just up until the cream sort of starts to shimmer, really. I don't really want it to boil. Okay, so I'm going to watch those there and stir that in like that. Lovely, that's good. So that over there, turn the heat down, just in case I forget about it, which I'm not planning to. So for the sauce, uh, whenever you're making caramel, a heavy bottom saucepan is a good idea. It's more, it's, it's more difficult to control if the saucepan is light. And we're making a dry caramel to start. So I'm simply just going to put in my dry sugar into my pan like that. And nothing is going to happen here for a few moments, so don't decide to go off and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Well, if you do, keep a half an eye on it. So you see the way it starts to caramelize unevenly. So when that happens, draw some of that in and spread the uncaramelized sugar out to the edge. Now, this is the point where you're thinking, what on earth is going on? Because some of the caramelized sugar has sort of set on my spoon and there's also some uncaramelized. But as I say, just keep at it. It's all going to come together really nicely. Now, we're getting very close. See with the color of a chestnut and just at the very last minute, those little bits of sugar just miraculously, of course it isn't a miracle, it's science, just melt out like that. And then you need to be ready. There we go, turn off the heat and then add in the cream. Careful, it'll bubble a little bit. Looks rather spectacular and beautiful. It also looks spectacularly odd. That's all good. 
So I've got to let this cook out just for a moment or two, just until that caramel dissolves. Sometimes every last little bit of that caramel doesn't dissolve out. That's not the end of the world. I'll get my chocolate in anyway. And then as it sits, it just, the caramel melts into it. Okay, that's good. It's pretty much ready to add in the chocolate. So that goes in. So you see what territory we're in now, chocolate and caramel. And that is basically that. That can be made. This will keep actually for weeks in your fridge if you can manage to hide it. Um, and then we'll reheat it gently just to, to liquefy it because it will set a little bit in the fridge. But now look, we've got a glossy chocolate sauce flavored with caramel, which will be the perfect accompaniment to serve with our hazelnut flavored panna cotta. So the roasted hazelnuts have been sitting in the cream for a couple of hours. Often I give them more time than I have to give them today. And, but they still have had enough time to infuse the cream pretty nicely. So we strain out the hazelnuts at this stage and then keep those hazelnuts. Now the cream is flavored with the hazelnut. I'm not let it go all over the place. Okay, there we are. We're going to serve those hazelnuts scattered around the little panna cottas in a few moments. Now, so save those. Sit those up there, they taste delicious at this stage. Then to this cream, we're going to sweeten it slightly with a little bit of caster sugar, flavor it with a little vanilla, about a half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. And all we're trying to do now is to warm this, I can use the same spoon, just to dissolve the sugar. That's all we're trying to do. And when that's ready, we can blend it with our gelatine, pop it into our molds. So I've my molds just lightly oiled. Again, sunflower oil or a grape seed oil, that bland oil. The purpose of oiling the molds is just so the panna cotta pops out nice and easily later on. So that's dissolved. Then the key rule, as we know with gelatine, measure it accurately. Then when I'm using powdered gelatine, I sponge it with a little bit of water until it looks like a sponge and then sit it over barely simmering water to dissolve until it's a clear looking liquid. And you always pour the mixture you're setting into the gelatine. So. Like that. And that essentially is our hazelnut flavored cream. I like to serve this in quite small portions. Sometimes I might serve eight people. That makes a very small portion. But today I'm going to serve six people with this. There we are. Now, here's the ones that I've set um, ahead of time, and we're back with our lovely chocolate and caramel sauce, which is looking shiny and absolutely delicious there. And the little, uh, little uh, panna cotta themselves. Now, I've got what can safely be described as an overscaled plate, because I think this simple little pudding deserves a little overscaled plate. You use the size plate you like in your family. And then just loosen around the edge, and then just pop it out, like that. Now, I like to add a little of the chopped hazelnuts into the sauce. You can serve some of them separately. Stir those in, like that, and then a slick of that. And nothing further required. Get closer to your cooking with Neff's Slide and Hide, proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell.